tonight we're going to go into the prophecies. This is, this is one of my favorite parts of teaching about heaven because it, there were so many uh, insightful things that I learned from the scriptures by, by doing this evaluation. So let me get into that. So uh, this is really what does the Bible prophecies teach about our eternal future, which includes heaven with God. Um, the, I'm going to start with Mark 12, verse 24. Jesus said, and he's talking to the Pharisees here, you're way off base, and here's why. One, you don't know your Bibles. Two, you don't know how God works. So the implication he's saying here is, if you knew your Bibles, you'd recognize I'm fitting the pattern of what God said would happen. Okay? We'll come back to that verse in a minute after I show you some others. Now I want to ask you a, a, a question. It's not a trick question, but think about when Paul went on his missionary journeys, where did he always go first when he went to a new city? Synagogue. Okay, that's great. Why? Why did he go to the synagogue first? To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Okay? So uh, think about this. It was commanded, which we just said, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans 1, verse 16. The gospel was for the Jew first. In fact, there was one time when Jesus was even rude to a lady because... She was a Gentile and she wanted healing and, and she said, even the dogs get the breadcrumbs. Can I have a breadcrumb of healing for my son? And he said, I've never seen faith like this in Israel. Go home, your son's real. It's the only time Jesus was rude in the Bible that I know of. But the gospel is for the, for the Jew first. Okay, so also the second reason that I think, and I think this is really the more important reason of the two, because God's always included Gentiles. He sent Jonah to Gentiles, you know, way back. But the Jews knew prophecy. This was key. Because if you think about it, uh, couldn't get my words to come up here. Imagine approaching a non-Jew in each city he'd go to and asking, hey, you know the prophecies about the Messiah? What would they say? What are you talking about? What's, what's a Messiah? See, there was no basis. But if you took that same question to a Jewish audience and you said, hey, you remember the prophecies about the Messiah? What would they say? Yes, he'll be born in Bethlehem. He'll be the descendant of David. He'll be this, he'll be this. They knew it. They were taught from, from birth. Uh, they, they learned about the Messiah that's going to come and save them, right? So, so the reason he went to the Jewish audience first was because it was commanded, but also because it was a starting point so you could say, this guy fulfilled those scriptures and he is the Messiah, and that helped establish the church. It was a fast start way uh, to get the church started in all these cities. Otherwise, you're starting over, see? But when they have a Jewish background and they understand prophecy, and all these prophecies pointed to a Messiah that's going to come, bam, it can happen fast. And that's, that's why he did that. There's a, there's a verse in Revelation 19, verse 10, that teaches us what prophecy is in the Bible for. It's to prove Jesus is the Christ. It's to prove He is the Messiah, that He's the Son of God. Okay? And remember, there's, there's two comings. He came first as a suffering servant. He's coming back as a King of kings, Lord of lords. He's going to rule. He's going to be on a white horse. Lots of details about that. Okay? So the prophecies of the Messiah point to Jesus as the literal, not just a symbolic fulfillment, a literal fulfillment to all these predictions that were written by many different authors over many different centuries, all inspired by God. So this common theme is important. See, prophecy paved the way for the church to begin and get established and to grow big in spite of being thrown to the lions, in spite of governmental opposition. We're not the first generation to face governmental opposition. We're, it's, it's starting to happen today, worldwide and some here. The only group it's okay to discriminate against right now are Christians. They can have a satanic club at the school, but they can't have a Bible club. So we're, we're, we're getting back to, to that uh, style, but that's what happened in the Roman times. They were, they were certainly under persecution, even to death. And, the, and prophecy paved the way for them to be successful in spite of all those things. So I think that's really key. Now you have to remember, as you look at these prophecies, we're going we're gonna to look at these two comings, and we're going to focus more on the first coming. But the prophecies about Jesus came really in two categories. 
first coming prophecies and second coming prophecies. Most people never differentiate the two. But there's a big difference between the two because of how he came the first time to suffer and came the second time to rule. Okay? And we're going to rule with him. See, we're going to reign and rule. He created Adam to have dominion. Well, that's his, still his plan for his people. And both comings are literal. He didn't come just symbolically the first time. He bled. He was flesh and blood just like us. And he's coming back. He left in a cloud. It says he's going to come back in a cloud. He's using the same elevator to come back down that he went up in. Okay? So the world wants us to talk about it being just symbolic and myths and all that. Even many of our Christian institutions teach this. Oh, it's just, it's just symbolic. You don't take it literally. These are good stories. That's even being taught in many churches, not just in our Christian colleges and secular colleges. So here, we, with the first verse in Mark 12, we saw about God's pattern. You don't know the Bible and you don't know how God works. So this is important to understand as you look at heaven and many other subjects in the Bible to look at God's pattern. There really was a David and Goliath. He really was nine feet tall. It's not just a myth or a fairy tale. There really was a Red Sea that parted. And it wasn't just a low spot with muddy water. It was a dry ground. Dry means, it's very important to understand this, dry means not wet. It wasn't muddy. It wasn't a strong wind that blew. No, it was a miracle. And you either believe that or you don't. It's a faith issue. Okay? So Scripture is revealing to us how God works, His pattern. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. So let me go through just not all of these, but quickly I'm going to go through a bunch of the first coming prophecies about Jesus. And let's see how many of them are literal and how many of them are symbolic. Okay? So Isaiah 7.14 says, uh, The virgin will conceive a child. She'll give birth to a son and call him Emmanuel, which literally means God with us, another literal interpretation. So that was literal. Then Micah 5 verse 2 uh, born in Bethlehem prophecy is also literal. But you, O Bethlehem, Ep Epithrath, who were too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in, Jerus in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. That's the ESV. Um, a star to signify the king. That was also literal. Okay, this is Numbers 24, 17. I see him, but not here and now. I perceive him, but far in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob. A scepter will emerge from Israel. Okay, it's easy to take that symbolic. And they kept interpreting, oh, it's just symbolic, just symbolic. But was there a star involved in Jesus' birth? Yeah, and did it lead people literally to the spot where the baby Jesus was born? Yes. So even prophecies that seem very unlikely are absolutely literal. Let them directly to Jesus. Uh, the kings would bring gifts is also literal. And we see that in the wise men. Psalm 72, 9 and 10. Desert nomads will bow before him. His enemies will fall before him in the dust. The western kings of Tarshish and other distant lands will bring him tribute. The eastern kings of Sheba and Seba will bring him gifts. What were the gifts? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. By the way, what was myrrh used for? Burial. Oh, you had a baby. Let me bring you a casket. That's what we're talking about here. Myrrh was used to, to bury. It was a spice for burial. Now, the gold, they're going to need some gold. They can't even go home and get Joseph's tools before they head to Egypt. They're going to need some gold to you know, live on and to buy tools so he can start working again to support the family. God provides just in time, provides needs for us. So this king would bring gifts. is also literal. Rachel's children dead. This comes from Jeremiah 31, 15. This is what the Lord says. A cry is heard in Ramah, deep anguish and bitter weeping. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for her children are gone. Okay, how many, uh, I think I've asked, I know there's at least two or three people have been to Israel on the tour. When you go to Israel on the tour, there is a church, in fact, there's two churches butted against each other sharing a wall, a Greek Orthodox church and a Roman Catholic church. Under that church, you go down on tours and you see all these baby skulls and baby bones. They were all buried. All the babies when Herod killed the babies. He was trying to kill baby Jesus. All the babies two years old and younger. It's all these tiny skulls. You, you can go see that on tour today in Israel. Rachel's children were gone. That's under, from the tribe. Rachel was the mother. Then called out of Egypt. That was also literal. 
when Israel was a child, I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Now we're going to come back to those in a few minutes. Hosea 1 verse 11. Again, literal. We're kind of batting a thousand so far, aren't we? Called a Nazarite was also literal. Judges 13, 5. Because you will become pregnant and have a son, you must never cut his hair because he will be a Nazarite given to God from birth. He'll begin to save Israel from the power of the Philistines. Why did they call him a Nazarite? Because he was from Nazareth. There's also the Nazarite that takes a vow, but they just said, well, that's just symbolic. But it wasn't symbolic. It was literal. He was literally a Nazareth. Nazarite. Um, someone would precede the Messiah. That was also literal. Who was it? John the Baptist. Isaiah 40, verse 3, A voice cries out in the desert, Clear a way for the Lord. Make a straight highway in the wilderness for our God. Um, Galilee was going to be full of glory. That was also literal. Because where did Jesus do all His miracles, by the way? Galilee. Where was His first miracle? Cana of Galilee. Okay. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali, which is Galilee, will be humbled. There will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, will be filled with glory. And we see that in Jesus' life and all the miracles He did. Isaiah 9, verse 1. The blind are going to see and the deaf are going to hear. That was also literal. Isaiah 35, 5 is the prediction. And when He comes, He'll open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. Now we could literally show you, you know, a bunches of scriptures where he did that in ministry and sometimes where it just says people stood in line all day. If you watch The Chosen, there were, there were scenes like that. They, he was exhausted at the end of the day because he healed people all day long. Blindness and, and uh, deaf, deaf were two of the big things that were, they came to him for healing. Isaiah 53, 4, the Messiah was going to bring healing, which was also literal. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. So we are healed by his wounds. Then Matthew 20, verse 18, uh, betrayed in Jerusalem is also literal. And this is uh, Jesus saying to himself, where the Son of Man, he called himself the Son of Man over and over, said, Jerusalem, where the Son of Man will be betrayed. He's telling his own, he's, predict he's doing his own prophecy. There's some places where it calls Jesus a prophet. But he is prophesying about himself when he says, I'm going to be betrayed. The Son of Man, and that's me, is going to be betrayed to the leading priests and to the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die, Matthew 20, 18. So uh, silent before his accus accusers was also literal. He was oppressed and treated harshly, that he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to slaughter. Now, lamb's a symbol, right? Okay, we've got a symbol here. But was he literally slaughtered? Yes. So yes, that, that has a symbol in it, but it doesn't take away. Symbols, Bible symbols always represent literal realities. I want to write a book someday that says that. Bible symbols always represent literal realities. Because I think that, that Goliath was a symbol of giants that you and I will face. Sometimes they're financial giants. Sometimes they're emotional giants. Sometimes it's, it's a physical thing that there's no way you could do it. But I think Goliath was also a real person. So just because there's a symbol there doesn't take away a literal reality. I'm not against talking about symbols. I'm against saying it's symbolic only because that's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, the Bible teaches the opposite. You're seeing the pattern here. This, if you know God, you know how it works. Here's the pattern. He fulfills His predictions literally so we know that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the reason for this. That's how we can prove it. Okay. So as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Isaiah 53, 7, which was fulfilled in Matthew 27, 12. When the leading priests and the elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. In fact, many times in the Gospels, as these prophecies are being fulfilled, it often says, you'll see it a time or two, but I didn't put all those quotes in here, this happened to fulfill Scripture. It doesn't say this happened to fulfill Scripture symbolically. Because it was always literally. Every one of these is literal. So we're starting to see that here. Then he was going to be wounded for our sins. Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins, beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. 
And then Matthew 27, 26 is one of the examples of the fulfillment of that, which is also literal. Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Then we have buried in a rich man's grave, which was also literal. Isaiah 53, 9, he had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. He, notice how in prophecy many times that was written way before Jesus was born, but it's written in the past tense. He was put. It doesn't say he will be put. That's an important thing to remember on looking at, at prophetic uh, verses in the Bible because God lives outside of time. See, we live in a four-dimensional world, length, width, depth, and time. And time only moves one direction. We can't go back in time. We can remember yesterday, but we can't go back to it. We can look forward to tomorrow, but we don't know what will happen. God sees tomorrow and yesterday the same because he lives, we live in linear, unidirectional time, like a rope. He lives in a bubble. He lives in a circle. He says, I know the end from the beginning. I can see if I touch Dan's life right here, I see good things will happen over here. I'm going to do it. Boop. Because God knows the whole picture. He lives in a sphere of time where we're in linear time. Now, that will change when we join Him in eternity. But for now, we're stuck in linear time. We can't go back. And so this prediction was written in the past tense, even though it was a future event. And then it was fulfilled in Matthew 27, 57 to 60. As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man, who specifically calls him a rich man, asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb, a rich man's tomb. Again, literal. Then we have the 30 pieces of silver prediction, and it's going to be thrown in the temple for a potter's field. I mean, this is very specific. This is Zechariah 11, verse 13. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, this magnificent, magnificent sum at which they valued me. So I took the 30 coins and threw them to the potter in the temple of the Lord. And that's exactly what happened. When Judas, who betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. So he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests and elders. I have sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man. What do we care? They retorted. That's your problem. Then Jesus threw the silver coins down, Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hanged himself. Very specific, and yet it came true exactly as predicted. So again, literal. Then we have uh, beat, mocked, and spat upon. Also literal. Isaiah 50, verse 6. I offered my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mockery and spitting. And then Matthew 26, 67. They began to spit in Jesus' face and beat him with their fists and some slapped him. Again, very, very specific and very, very literal. He was going to teach in parables. Ezekiel 20, verse 49. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, they say of me, does he not speak parables? And then Matthew 13, 3 is one of the instances that is, is told as a fulfillment being literal. He told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant seeds. Over and over and over, that's how he taught. He taught in stories. He taught in parables. The Messiah would be rejected which was also literal. Psalm 118, 22. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the what? Cornerstone. Cornerstone. Then we see Mark 8, 31. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must be rejected. He must suffer and be rejected. Okay? Again, literal. Some of these I'm showing you the prediction and the fulfillment. Many of them are automatic. You know the fulfillment. Uh, Messiah was going to suffer. Matthew 26, 39. Uh, he said, let this cup of suffering uh, be taken from me. That specific <coughs> words mentioned. Uh, also, Mark 8, 31, Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer. Again, he's, he's giving his own prophecy about his own future, but it's still a prophecy. And it came true literally. Then, the fact that he would die. He said it himself. Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and died. He predicted his own death, which you saw in the previous verses. 
Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must be killed, Mark 8, 31. Those are two in the wrong order. Then there's the fulfillment. He cried out and died in Matthew 27, 50. He was going to be resurrected. That was also literal. Remember when he said, touch my hands, feel my side? I'm not a ghost. I'm, I'm, I'm tangible. Okay. Uh, Psalm 16, 10. You will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Okay, written by David, and it's a, it's a uh, prophecy about, the, about Jesus. By the way, it's also a prophecy about David, because David's going to be resurrected too. See? Many, many prophecies, and we don't have time to get into this. Many of these are double prophecies. They have a near and a far fulfillment. Many times a prophet would, would give a sentence, and, um, and, and he would say, this is going to happen, and this. And, and between the two things, he has the word and, and there might be hundreds of years between the two. So again, outside of God's outside of time. In fact, uh, one that comes to mind that's very specific, that's a great example of this. Remember when Jesus got up in the temple and read that verse and said, and he closed the book and every eye was on him and he said, today, that scripture has been fulfilled in your, in your hearing. And they were so mad they took him out to stone him. You remember what he read? He read a verse from Isaiah, I think it's 62, and, he, and the verse said, and the Messiah is going to come and bring healing and judgment. There's at least 2,000 years between the healing he brought and the judgment that's still coming. But there's not even a comma in the sentence. And he stopped the sentence before he got to the judgment part. He's going to come bring healing. Close the book. Today you've seen that with your very own eyes. They were mad and wanted to stone him. If he'd have finished the sentence, he couldn't have said that. That's how specific. Talking about every jot and tittle will be fulfilled. That's a comma and an apostrophe in Hebrew. It's very specific. God is saying over and over, just like we talked about in creation, there was an evening and a morning and another day. Are there millions of evenings in a day and millions or billions? No, there's, it's singular. God invented language. He knows what words to use. So here the Messiah was going to resurrect, written in Psalm 16.10. And then we see Acts 13.34. God had promised to raise him from the dead, not leaving him to rot in the grave. He said, I'll give you the sacred blessings I promised to David. David had wrote that verse, is even mentioned in the verse where it discusses the fulfillment in the New Testament. I just find that fascinating. I think we've, we've overlooked a great way to reach people for the kingdom with the gospel by talking about prophecy. And if we ignore prophecy and how Jesus fulfilled the first coming and now we can expect Him to be here for the second, it changes your whole attitude about bringing people into the kingdom and sharing what's important. Knowing the ball scores, I love sports, but that's not near as important as what we're talking about. It's eternal. It makes an eternal difference in people's lives. His hands and feet were going to be pierced. Very specific. Crucifixion out of all the... Thousands of years of, of history, it was only used for about a hundred years. Jesus had to be born just at the right time, make just the right people mad, and, and to have his hands and feet pierced and, and nailed to a cross. In fact, there's a, there's a mathematics genius, I can't think what his name is now, but I saw his video where he talked about uh, there's 119 or so first coming prophecies about Jesus. And if you just took a person in history and you said, I want this person to fulfill 36 prophecies somewhere in history. Remember, these were written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And we've got 36 prophecies, and they all be fulfilled in one person's life. You know what the odds of that are? It's astronomical. I can't even, I can't even say the number, but it's the same equivalent as if you covered the state of Texas in silver dollars and painted one red and set a blind man loose somewhere in Texas and ask him to find the red one on his first pick. That's the odds of just 36 prophecies coming true in one man's life. And here we're talk we've already talked about 20 or 30 tonight in Jesus' life. And every one of them literal. See, the, the mathematically that's not even possible. Okay? They nailed him to the cross. That's why his hands or feet were pierced. That form of execution is not used anymore. We use other forms of execution today. And it was only used a very short window. Hanging was really common. Okay? So then we have gamble for his clothes. Again, a really specific prophecy. Psalm 22, 18. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice 
for my clothing. It wasn't our normal kind of dyes. They were kind of made with bones and they were shaped funny. And I don't even know how exactly how it worked. But in Mark 15, 24, it was the literal fulfillment of that. The soldiers nailed him to the cross. They divided his clothes and threw dice to decide who would get each piece. Again, very specific and very literal. Not a bone broken. This is also important because normally when people are crucified, they break their bones to hurry up the process. They break their leg bones because they could push up with their leg and then catch their breath and then they'd get exhausted and fall and they couldn't breathe anymore and they'd push up. You break their bones on the legs, they can't push up anymore. And they're dead in a matter of seconds, a couple of minutes at the most. I can count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat, Psalm 22:17. And then it also says in Psalm 34, 20, the Lord protects the bones of the righteous. Not one of them is broken. Okay? And then John 19, 33 to 36. But when they came to Jesus and they were going to break his bones, they saw he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water flowed out. This report is from an eyewitness giving an accurate account. He speaks the truth so that you also may continue to believe. These things happened in fulfillment of the scriptures that say not one of his bones will be broken. Now, that's the other interesting thing about this. It's many of these passages, we would never have connected the dots between these verses I'm showing in Isaiah and Psalms. Some of them you would. Some of them it's the same wording or it's exactly fulfilled. But, but many of them are kind of obscure. Okay. But the New Testament, as you go through, and you can read your own Bible and see this, it'll cross-reference and, and show you that verse. And many times it says, this happened to fulfill the Scripture, and it'll quote part of the Old Testament verse. And in fact, look up born of a virgin. I don't have that in this list because it takes too long to go through and explain, and we don't have enough time tonight to do all these things. But born of a virgin comes from a, a, a battle that they were in in the Old Testament where Israel was fighting an enemy, and God says, ask me for a sign so that uh, you'll, know I'm, you'll know I'm going to let you win tomorrow. And I think it was David that said, you pick the sign. We don't know. You pick it. It wasn't David. It was one of the other kings. But he said, you pick the sign. And God says, okay, uh, uh, born of a virgin. How does that connect to this? But the Scripture tells us that's the passage. It fulfills that Scripture. So many times we have to look at what the New Testament tells us and where it came from to even make the connection. And yet, every one of them are literal. Even the star appearing from the sky. They had been watching the sky to know there was a new star. There's so many factors at play here. Here's a big one. Sign of Jonah. Literal. Matthew 12, 39 to 40. Jesus replied, Only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. They were saying, do us a sign. Show us a sign. Prove you're who you say you are. He said, but the only sign I'll give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, which he was. So there's the list we just went through. And notice they're all literal. Born of a virgin, bring healing, fill Galilee with glory, betrayed by a friend for 30 silver, mocked and spat on, rejected by his own, wounded and died for our sins, buried in a rich man's tomb, not a bone broken, gamble for his clothes, hands and feet pierced, rise in three days, be rejected, be the cornerstone of the church, and there's many others. Born of a virgin is not even in this list. So there's, there's about, like I say, about 119 first coming. By the way, there's about 330 second coming prophecies, which include heaven and eternity with God. So my reason for studying this and figuring out how many of these were literal was to know how to apply God's pattern to the prophecies about heaven and eternity with Him. And this was a shocker to me. They're all literal. Big shocker to me. Some of these prophecies even seem to be mutually exclusive. Born in Bethlehem means you're a Bethlehemite. But he was a Nazarite. But called a Nazarite or a Nazarene could be you took the vow. So he could be a Bethlehemite and take the Nazarene vow. But then called out of Egypt? Well, symbolically, he would be called out of Egypt because his ancestors were in slavery in Egypt for 430 years. But they escaped that and came to the land, the promised land. But how did God make these three that seemed to be mutually exclusive all become fulfilled literally? 
They had to have a census, so he was born in Bethlehem. They had to go there for the census. Mary was pregnant at just the right time and due to have that baby at just the right spot. And then he was called a Nazarene because he was, grew up in Nazareth. And then why was he in Egypt? Because Herod's killing all the babies. Run to Egypt. Send an angel to tell them. They didn't even quit. If I'd tell Mary Lynn that God said we need to move to Alaska tomorrow, she'd think I ate bad pizza, you know. But they didn't even question it. They expected to hear from God that, that way. And so he was literally called out of Egypt because they also were told, hey, Herod's dead, you're safe, come on back. I called my son out of Egypt, see? So all these that even seemed to be mutually exclusive, God figured out a way. God made a way so that they were also uh, literal. I just found that fascinating. And I think it's one of the most surprising Bible facts that I've ever discovered. In fact, the other people I know, and they're all really some good books. Randy Alcorn has a great book on heaven called Heaven, and then... Uh, N.T. Wright has a great book on heaven, and, and uh, none of those guys talk about this, about the fact that prophecies teach us to take the Bible for what it says. Okay? So they were all fulfilled literally. Back to Jesus' words. You're way off base because you don't know your Bible and you don't know how God works. Remember, the Pharisees, who were the religious elite, should have been going to Jesus and saying, oh, okay, now if you're the Messiah, where were you born? Oh, Bethlehem. Oh, that matches. Where'd you grow up? Oh, Nazareth. Oh, I'm called a Nazareth. Oh, wow. And who was your daddy? Well, my mom was a virgin. You know, they didn't investigate any of that. They were mad at him threatening their power structure. So they were more interested in discrediting Jesus than checking on whether or not he did fulfill the scriptures. And they were leading the church astray. They were leading God's people astray. And that can happen today. This is why I love the verse, the Christians at Berea were more noble than those at Thessalonica because they, what? Studied the scriptures daily to see if the things being taught were true. I'm a human. I could make mistakes. Go look up these verses for yourself. Talk to God. Pray about it. Ask God to show you. I'm still finding things I didn't know was in the Bible. It's there. It's me that still has a lot to learn. Okay? So remember, the purpose of prophecy is to be a witness for Jesus. I would say these do a great job of that. Revelation 19.10. Look it up in your version. So if you want to extrapolate that, that's what we're talking about to kind of wind this up. If all the first coming for prophecies were fulfilled literally, what does that reveal about all the second coming prophecies that talk about heaven and eternity with God and the lamb laying down with the lion and those kind of things? You see, you've got, to, you've got to choose. I'm not going to tell you how to believe on that, but I'm going to tell you, when I reread the Bible, thinking, well, what if they're literal too? Many, many, many verses made sense that had never made sense to me before. It became so much clearer. So that's the dilemma you've got to decide on. I'm not going to tell you how to... Now, I will want to say one more thing about this. False prophets in the Old Testament were to be killed. Deuteronomy 13.5 is one of the commandments about that. The false prophets or visionaries who try to lead you astray must be put to death, for they encourage rebellion against the Lord your God, who redeemed you from slavery and brought you out of the land of Egypt, since they led you astray from the way of the Lord your God commanded you to live. You must, it wasn't optional, you must put them to death. In this way, you'll purge the evil from among you. So here's what could never happen in ancient times. And this is what modern Bible class teachers are trying to teach. What could never happen in ancient times, I couldn't come to town and say, hey, I'm Prophet Steve. And I want to say to you, you know, uh, your city here is so evil that uh, if you don't all repent in sackcloth and ashes by 2 o'clock on Tuesday, fire from heaven is going to destroy the whole city. Okay, next Tuesday at 2.01 and there's no fire from heaven, you got your rock and you're looking for Steve because I'm a false teacher. But I could never defend myself by saying, oh, oh, it, it was symbolic. You're, you're all dead and you don't really know it. I, I mean, I saw the fire from heaven. You're, you're burned to a crisp. You just can't see. I see reality and you can't see it. No, because then you wouldn't be told to kill the prophet. That teaches that prophecy is literal. But I've never heard a Bible class teacher or preacher anywhere ever say that. And that's why this whole study was such a shock for me to discover. So chew on that, pray about that, read the verses for yourself, don't distrust me. Uh, but the pattern that Jesus fussed at the Pharisees for not recognizing 
was that God's pattern is that He fulfills it. That's how we prove Jesus is the Messiah. And that's why this heaven that we're going to be talking about the next few weeks is very exciting to me because that's a place I... A place where there's 24-7 worship sitting on a cloud playing a harp is not attractive even to Christians, much less non-Christians. That is not what we're taught about heaven. We're not going to be a floating ghost. We're going to talk more uh, about resurrection and our new bodies, and it, the Bible says it will be tangible. It doesn't say you'll be a see-through. I can show you the verses. We'll look at that later. Next week, uh, however, which will be two weeks from tonight, I'll be out of town next week, and Luke will be subbing. We're going to talk about Satan's strategy against heaven. And I'll just leave you with this verse and then open it up for any questions tonight. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps. It's a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Ephesians 6.12, the message. Okay. Does anybody have a question about tonight's section or anything we've covered so far? Okay. We're kind of out of time. Uh, Mark, you got one? Yep, never a bone broke. Yeah, and they they nailed Jesus to that cross, his hands and his feet. Yeah. And Had they not break a bone? They, they put a spear in his side. In his side. How did they not break a rib? You know, I was just always wondering. Well, of course, it's easy. Of course, there's from below too. He's up high on a cross, so it's easy there to go under a rib. And up up here, I always said, "Well, how'd you miss a hand?" But they probably went through the wrist between the two main bones in the arm because the hand it would have ripped out. Yeah. You know, uh, physically, it's not really possible. So probably it was in the wrist, and many of the pictures do depict that, but not always. But that's a good question. That's, that's my answer on that. Anybody else? Okay, we've kind of finished on time. Let me uh, end it with a prayer, and we'll, uh, I'll be back in two weeks. We'll see you in two weeks. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today, for all the ways you love us and take care of us, for all these wonderful people who've come in on a Wednesday night to draw closer to you and to to learn more about heaven. Help us to get so excited about it that we have to share it with others. Give us uh, the right words for the right moment for the right people and help us to make a difference around us in our daily lives. Use us today and every day to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.